Okay, so, so I need. Okay. So if sir is there, I can talk later. No, no, you carry on. Okay. Uh, so good morning and uh, thanks to Dr. Pandey and Dr. Shini for adjusting me in this last minute. So I'm going to talk on a rather controversial topic. That is the role of the surgery in the internal cavernous malformations. So these are my disclaimers. And we are, uh, we should remember Dr. Mukherjee for all and practice over it. So what is the impression of the cavernoma in our mind? Usually we carry an impression that it is a harmless benign creature, even if it bleeds, it doesn't cause much problem. There is no growth. That's whenever you see a little popcorn appearance, that means it has bled earlier. It might be a single bleed or multiple bleed. Most of the times it's an incident loma and we just want to observe them. If do anything, then the answer should be surgery. That is our uh, notion most of the times. And we have a firm belief that radio surgery is ineffective for cavernoma. That is a myth which I'm going to discuss. So cavernoma right from the time of its diagnosis, its identification, it's a topic of disputed identity, which uh, Devapujari sir was also telling about. We have nothing firm about it, right from origin, pathogenesis, natural history. Should we treat it, when to treat it, and how to treat it? But now with it's in the post-MRI era, we are more uh, sure about that the it is sufficient. Risk is more in patients with the prior to symptomatic hemorrhages. Women, especially in the first semester of pregnancy, are at more risk. And hemorrhages are really life-threatening until it is... So if there is any contender which carries similar kind of the controversies in the literature, that is only trigeminal neuralgia compared to the cavernoma. But with the advent of MRI, cavernous malformation is now the most common intracranial vascular malformation. There are multiple lesions which are now common in the familial forms. 10 to 30% are associated with the developmental venous anomaly. And the most common presentation is seizures, followed by the intracranial bleed. Let's come to the first option of observation. That is a fairly acceptable option for an incident luma. Because for an incident luma, surgery or radio surgery may exceed, may have a skewed risk benefit analysis. And even after a single bleed, the risk of the additional hemorrhages remain low. And that risk is 2.4% per lesion per year. But in the immediate blood period, there is a period for nearly around and there is a risk of subsequent bleed, that is the temporal hemorrhage clustering. And with each subsequent bleed, there is a cumulative morbidity and mortality. And this increases significantly high if it is in the brain stem or any eloquent part. It carries an epileptogenic potential if it is in the medial temporal lobe or Rolandic cortex. And it makes a complex array of the cortical subcortical pathway, which may lead to a drug epilepsy in around 40% of the case. So, if any cavernoma needs a treatment, my first impression is to go with the surgery. Surgery is a straightforward one. You remove cavernoma, there is a prevention of the re -bleed. You remove the hemocytoid ring and the surrounding area, so that causes the control of the seizure in most of the cases. But surgery should be done elegantly, safely, without creating a deficit. If it's not, we have other, other options. In pre-MRI era, the surgical series had a dismal result, and they didn't allow to operate until it is really very symptomatic because it was a lesion and uh, to find a lesion, it had to lead to collateral damages, which was significantly high in the pre-MRI era. After post-MRI era, the results are very good. We have uh, intraoperative monitoring and we can lesion, definitely get the lesion. And surgery is straightforward. There is no problem to control the bleeding and there's a glial plane surrounded by the hemocytin ring and we get an excellent outcome. Yes, clip set. So the two studies which I am telling are from the leading centers, one from the SAMI group, another from the Barrow group, which was published by Ablatol. And in those patients, it was found that the cranial nerve deficit was in 47% patient and permanent deficits in around one third. And one astonishing fact was that overall post-operative risk of a new bleeding event was 2% per year, even when... So you cannot ensure the patient that you are completely cured of the trouble. Let's come to the third option if the risk of surgery is high. Our aim is to the risk of bleeding and decrease the chances of the seizures, but it should have a low risk of the treatment-related side effects. So now you, if you search on the PubMed, you will find more than 500 articles, including case series and uh, longs on uh, cavernomas for uh, radio surgery for the cavernomas. Our indications of GKRS at PGI, which we follow with the Pittsburgh protocol, is that two or more clinically distinct hemorrhages, a typical M image confirming the diagnosis of cavernous malformation, 
a true abm or D dva is excluded in the presence of multiple cavernous malformation only the symptomatic one is to be treated and the estimated risk of the surgical resection will to the patient only then he becomes a candidate for gkrs so the early series results which were in the 80s and the 90s of the radio surgery they had a poor outcome they were not satisfactory because and they tried to target the whole of the cavernoma which included the hemosiderin ring targeting a hemosiderin ring is bound to create complications because hemosiderin is rich in iron which is a radio if you give up to that radio stimulant area it may lead to perilesional edema and seizures they used to include the dva into it that lead to the venous closure and that led to the perinational edema and in some cases uh, bleed also and the earlier practice of the high dose in the range of 16 to 20 gray that led radiation is placed to the hemosiderin ring and worsened the seizure episode but now after the 90s when they reduced the dose and when they started targeting the lesion inside the inner ring of the hemosiderin the results were much better so this was a uh, Re, uh, the control of the hemorrhage in the brain stem cavernomas the pre srs the rate was 34% after srs within 2 years it reduced to 9.7% and after the srs it reduced significantly to 0.56% per year from the earlier rate of the 34% per year that is in the brain stem areas i especially like to comment on these articles which were from chefield group they published it in two series separately for the deep seated ones thalamic and brain stem and then the treatment outcomes for the hemispheric cavernomas so first coming to the deep seated cavernomas of 210 patients with 210 uh, patients with 210 cavernomas with a robust follow up of nearly around 20 years with a median 5.5 years in the patients with the single bleed the rate reduced from 2.4% per year to 1.1% per year after 2 years and in patients of the multiple bleed it reduced from 2.8% to 1.3% per year so they concluded that the benefit of early treatment appears to be the results as repeated hemorrhages carry the risk of significantly high cumulative morbidity than the morbidity associated with the srs in the second one which had an uh, objective to get the long term effect of srs in hemorrhage and seizure control in the superficial cavernous malformation and they compared it from the deep seated ones so in the patients with the single bleed it reduced from 2.7 to 0.7% after 2 years of srs and in the patients of multiple bleeds from 2.1% to 1.3% after 2 years of the gamma knife radio surgery so one thing is clear that it takes time nearly around more than years between there might be temporal hemorrhagic clustering and the gamma knife as you know it takes time somewhere around 6 months to 3 years to appear so in that immediate period after gamma knife you have an increased rate as is evident in the natural history but a good fact to know is that the rate of improvement in the epilepsy was 84.9% after srs in patients at least one seizure prior to the treatment and these patients who were earlier drug resistant could have a favorable outcome in more than 81% patients with an angel 1 and the angel 2 outcome so the conclusive statement was that with the pre treatment hemorrhage led to the permanent deficit in 40 and four single bleed in 46.1 with the multiple bleed but it reduced significantly after the srs and the factors which affected the outcome were younger age deep lesion location and multiple pre treatment hemorrhages i am presenting PGI experience of the last ten years with the thirty-three patients who all had bled, and uh, nearly seventy percent of these patients had uh, the lesion in the cerebral hemisphere, eighteen percent in brainstem, and twelve percent in the thalamus. Once in the hemisphere, they were in the eloquent cortex. All patients had radiologic evidence of bleed. Seventy percent presented with seizures, and twelve point one percent had drug-resistant epilepsy. Sixty-seven percent of these patients more than two years of the follow-up. So. Uh, only three patients out of these 33 patients rebled, out of which only one needed surgery, as it was now an extra lesional bleed. And the post G annual rate was 1.82 percent. Rest to a radiological detection of the rebleed, but they did, they were not clinically symptomatic. As far as the seizure control is concerned, 82.6 percent of these patients achieved reasonable seizure control in N1 and N2. And two patients needed microsurgical lesionectomy. That I admit because they were not controlled with it. the favorable outcomes which we found is that if the lesion is in other location than the medial lobe the history of the seizures and the simple partial seizures the hemosiderin should not be given radiation otherwise the seizure uh, outcome would be poor let's be realistic about the outcome this is not like an avm where you would see a complete obliteration of the nidus after 3 years hemo uh, uh, cavernous malformation is just a leaky endothelium so what you see after 2 to 3 years is that 
resort, it is not disappear and that becomes an important part of the counseling of the patient that you may see the cavernoma in your follow-up MRIs, but it is uh, it has not bled. So this is a, a nearly a third ventricular cavernoma. After the three years follow-up, you can see a significant volumetric reduction. This is a brainstem cavernoma after seven years with no subsequent bleed in between. I do have a share of adverse radiation. In the literature, it has been reported in uh, around 33% patients. But, but as I said earlier, it's mostly radiological only. 12% had clinical adverse reactions, which were controlled with short course of it's permanent only in two points. This patient presented with the motor seizures to me in a Rolandic cortex. He had a worsened hemiparesis within one year as I practiced earlier a higher dose of 16 gray and vital and vitamin E for three months and he became completely normal. But that was uh, a trouble for the patient. So coming to the conclusion once, how much is too much? Now the dose should only be 12 to 13 gray at 50% ice. Should not touch the DVA, otherwise you are bound to land into trouble. And if it is a cavernoma, there is a hemosiderin ring surrounding it. There is an outer ring and the inner ring. You should keep yourself to the inner ring of the hemosiderin with a half dose fallout at the periphery. So coming to the controversial topics, which routinely still are in our mind, and people say that it is ineffective and associated with the high risk of complication, that is wrong because that was in the techniques, experience, selection, and the training bias. There is no end point of the treatment. I agree to it because this would shrink, but it wouldn't disappear. It may partially reduce, but would not appear from the scan after radiation. The other myth was that the patient outcome after SRS remains unsatisfactory. This is mostly a biased opinion based on the poor outcome in people's own radio surgery experience because they had in the radio technique and variation in the radio surgery tool. One should be clear in our mind that if you are giving a focused radiation to something like a cavernous malformation, you should be extremely 3D conformal because you have a hemosiderin ring. The uh, cyber knife and lineac radio surgery, this is not possible and it is not suitable for a cavernous malformation radio surgery. So if you are considering a cavernous malformation, gamma neck should be the option for that patient. Important discussion which and uh, argument which comes that the long-term hemorrhage rate reduction documented by SRS may be a part of the natural history of the disease. I partially agree to it until we have a very long-term process registries, but the studies so far up to two to three years decade experience, they have shown that there is a definite reduction in the hemorrhage rate, especially in the deep seated lesions compared to the natural history of the disease and its availability in treatment option in patients with the high risk cavernous malformation. The literature provides a level two evidence that SRS significantly reduces the rebreed rate, especially after the two years of the treatment. It can support it, but the Lunsport group tells that uh, if you compare radio surgery with the observation alone, radio surgery gives a better quality adjusted life year and the long term cost of the final efficiency in comparison to the observation alone. So, there was a consensus guideline published in 2017 in neurosurgery is that radio surgery may be considered in the solitary cavernous malformation with previous. If the cavernous malformation lies in the eloquent areas that carry an unacceptable high surgical risk. So, I am pro for radio surgery for cavernous malformations which are in eloquent cortex, particularly then and the thalamus. Radio surgery is not recommended for the asymptomatic cavernous malformations, for malformations that are surgically accessible, nor in familial CCM because of the concern about the de novo genesis. So, if you can excise it, go for the excision, but if it's not, or the risk benefit analysis, this benefit ratio is skewed in your hands, then radio surgery should be given as an option. So the take home message is that SRS and very reduction in the risk of additional bleed strong cavernous malformation. There is definite improvement in the seizure control. The benefits are more pronounced after two years. So you need to have a patient in your patient. patient. For eloquent zone, SRS is preferred to surgery on the risk benefit analysis. And we need to be realistic in our expectations that this might be in the head on the follow up scans. My question to all of you is that I believe that there was never or there is no unbred cavernoma. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Manjul. Um, we'll take two, uh, three or four questions now and followed by Dr. Dev Pujari's uh, uh, lecture. In the meantime, I think I'll request Dr. Dev Pujari to just uh, check his share screen yeah. is working or not. Till, can, you, uh, can you unshare screen, uh, Manjul? Uh, sir. Manjul, uh, nice yeah, talk yeah. and uh, yes. congratulations to you for all that and keep on going up and up. But the thing uh, I just Thank wanted you. to know for my knowledge, is there any difference in the technique for the 
about the gamma knife to be given in deep seated lesions and in the brain stem and particularly in the brain stem in the different locations as for option pretty sir one thing is that to avoid any radiation induced side effect your dose should be 12 to 13 days so that remains irrespective of the location inside the thing thing you should make a very good plan you should give a proper time in making a plan so that you remain confined to the inner ring of the hemosiderate that would avoid any kind of complication in patients so in a hemispheric one you can go with a 13 gray 14 gray but for a brain stem one you should just limit yourself to the 12 gray at 50% isodose so that the damage should be minimized if you are not at all benefiting the patient Ah, uh, one thing it's uh, uh, it uh, the question which I am asking it may appear ridiculous or something, but the thing is that do you, is there any study available which shows the histological changes in gamma knife BVM after autopsy? The patients have died because of something else. Would you follow what I am asking? Yes, autopsy, autopsy finding after gamma knife. After yeah. gamma knife for AVM, so you are asking. Yes, yes, AVM. AVM. No, no. I am talking of Kevano. We are talking of only Kevano. Is there any studies available? Yes, sir. There are studies, but these are not autopsy studies. These are Kevano mass excised later. Excised. Excised after gamma knife. Yes, sir. So there was not much difference they could identify. It was just a leaky endothelium which was usually found, so they couldn't. they have done a few in cases of the de novo uh, a radiation induced cavernoma genesis which they did for something else and they found that a cavernoma has a close vicinity of the area which has received the radio surgery and they didn't find any much difference from the routine histopathology of a cavernoma from these radiation induced cavernomas or earlier radio yeah dr manjul i have a question sir uh, Yeah, means you stressed on that uh, it, one should not include the hemosiderin pigment, and that is most cesarogenic. But in microsurgery, it is the principle is unless you remove that, a caesar doesn't get controlled. So in microsurgery, okay. when we remove caesar, get controlled. Here you leave it, caesar get controlled. How do you explain that, sir? I I do not advocate giving radio surgery to a cavernoma. Which is presented with caesar. The thalamic cavernoma or a brainstem cavernoma usually do not present with caesar. They are presented with the hem. But then you and you stress that caesar control was eighty percent. That means half of sixty percent of our cases were superficial ones. Because sir, it reduces the chances of the reveal. So the accumulative accumulation of the hemosiderin in the periphery of uh, the cavernoma, the chances of that reduces. So the primary outcome which we are going to get is because of the reduction of the hemorrhage. Well. hemorrhage gets reduced the subsequent deposition of the hemosiderin and the irritation to the surrounding brain cortex that reduces so in that way it leads to a good outcome if you so include I'm hemosiderin going. what happens anas manjur sir yes. i have a question just one, one second yeah, dr mishra followed by dr sri and dr parth can i have a question please manas can i yes manas, uh, through your uh, answer to your query the radiation can uh, even if it is not given you know the the isodose what you are giving is inside the uh, the hemosiderin ring but there is a radiation fall off to the hemosiderin so that could be one of the reasons i mean you are not targeting the hemosiderin but that could still uh, have a radiation effect so but that but having said, i'm no i'm i was not uh, going to talk about it uh, i mean i think uh, it has to be in this forum uh, the alternate view has to be uh, Put and we very strongly disagree with the concept of uh, radio surgery for cavernomas. In fact, uh, how many years now? Ninety-seven. So twenty odd years, we have not done a single cavernoma with radio surgery. Not one. Not one. Uh, but uh, what uh, Manjul is saying that he is not in uh, isolation. There are a lot of groups who are doing it. Of course, Pittsburgh group were the pioneers, and then the Austrian group are very strong. Vienna from Vienna, uh, they are very strong uh, advocates of uh, uh, radio surgery in cavernoma. To my mind, uh, uh, Manjul showed one uh, away uh, this uh, motor cortex cavernoma. These are very easy surgery. I mean, these are uh, uh, surgery which can be done with some monitoring and awake current. You remove it, and the patient is cured. 
giving radio surgery to that is actually high risk than not doing anything to my mind so except an ava a cavernoma in the brain stem which is not coming to the surface i don't find any area which is not accessible and what is eloquent obviously has to be decided and then many of these a cavernomas probably don't need treatment which has which has uh, you know inside the middle of the brain stem probably they're better left alone so i think i would put down the alternate view we do not agree there is no evidence to suggest there is nothing to say that we have cured the patient the follow up are very very small i mean these cavernomas can be can be silent for years together so to say about 2 to 3 years some data uh, about talking about natural history to my mind uh, dr darakna yeah i think that was the same point which i wanted to make what professor bk made the fact is as the fallacy of most of the follow ups in cavernomas is that they have a very short follow ups and we know that cavernomas remain quiescent for a long period of time and then there's a clustering of hemorrhages in hemor cavernomas so uh, I, i mean uh, i agree with uh, bkm sir that uh, we also have not treated much uh, cavernomas at all in our center even though we have been treating for almost 15 years now So, so comment from Dr. Suri and Dr. Pathak. Then we go to the next lecture. Yeah, nice talk, Manjul. But very nice uh, review of literature and uh, some experiences. But uh, I have a counter view. Uh, I, I think Dr. Mishra spoke before. Uh, uh, spoke that very much. I am completely against giving. You 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 worked with Adams as well. So I am very much completely against uh, giving radio surgery for cavernomas. Though uh, my own department, my there are some some colleagues. Who are as enthusiastic as you are, and they they are they're doing it, and they claim very good results. No contradiction to that. But I personally feel that uh, if for a motor cortex, if you are if there's a cavernoma sitting with using uh, motor mapping and be, uh, using intraop monitoring and using functional MR, you can easily take uh, uh, you can take and navigation you can take this take this, take these out with with practically no deficits. Second, in if they are in, In, in the middle of the thalamus, or uh, or they are facing the ventricle, like the case by which you showed, facing the third ventricle, they can also be excised by transclosal fluid easily. But the problem is the brainstem. Your pons, they are still accessible. You can go one a couple of millimeters in there, and uh, midbrain as well, except the area which are which which are in the tegmentum. That is one place. But tegmentum, I feel, is one place, and medulla is another place. But there. i feel if your if your knife is doing harm i think your radiation is doing much more harm so it so better to just leave the, the tegmentum tegmentum and medulla alone and do not do anything so if it, i always think that if i have a cavernoma in my tegmentum or my medulla would i would i um, burn it or would i uh, would i cut it i would do neither so i think uh, that and if it bleeds if it bleeds several times it usually comes to a surface where you can probably use some specialized skull this approach that is the only uh, thing there it is good I, manjul please I, uh, please answer to all the queries right dr parthak uh, comment and then he can answer together <laughs> dr parthak you wanted to comment yes i mean uh, i think uh, there is a little bit of uh, misunderstanding of the whole issue what manjul is saying is the study and dr vasant mr forgot to point out to that and i was part of the team Uh, of radio surgery in Sheffield, it's Matthias Radatz, who has got a 20 years follow up, now. and that study clearly shows that there is a benefit definitely in the deep seated AVMs which are not accessible to surgery. And you also understand in the West, the option is left to the patient, and in every clinic you have to discuss all the benefits, the long term follow up problems, what are the consequences of long term follow up, and the patient sometimes choose. and by virtue of that it's a beautiful study uh, there are series of beautiful study by matthias from sheffield 20 years follow up is a huge follow up where they have shown some benefit definitely i am not saying that the avm the the cavernum is wiped out there is no chance of rebreed but there is definitely an alternative to risk reduction in these cases so uh, just straight away to say that cavernoma uh, radiation radio surgeon cavernoma is not effective not really tenable is not right number one the my question to manjul is is there any study now to use proton beam in the brain stem area because that's the brag pick effect would then also reduce any harmful effects so just to know something from him so thank you sir and uh, 
as i have told the results of surgical use from two leading centers tamil and from the baroda which are pioneers in the vascular surgery they have proven that nearly in one third of these patients they have suffered from the permanent neurology so we have to agree somewhere that lesions in these eloquent cortex surgical opening of these lesions we may create a problem and that is permanent in one third that with it second point is when you should treat when they are in an eloquent cortex i have already shown in my initial slides that when the risk benefit analysis or risk benefit ratio is skewed and when the patient is sitting and he is asking that i may have accumulative morbidity and mortality with the repeated bleed which you are telling in the nature history there should always be a treatment option given to it which has some evidence though it evidence but it's a substantial evidence with the 2 to 3 d 3 tickets of the experience in support of the radio surgery now that option should be made clear to the patient the third option Thank of you. the proton beam uh, the third one is for the proton beam which dr patil sir asked yes there are studies sir but they do not have a follow up of more than 1 to 1 and a half decade because they were earlier from a uh, us series only uh, proton centers are now coming up so we are just waiting for the results and in those ones as they boast early that the results of proton beam are safer in the pediatric population that was not same in two uh, um, in the last two years which are the studies published on the long term results in the rat journals they have shown that the radiation induced complications are there in the proton beam radio surgery as well it is a penalty for these lesions in uh, in the eloquent cortex and the results are nearly comparable to the other uh, modes of the radio surgery as compared to, with comparison to the proton find much difference in the outcome with the proton in comparison to the radio surgery with gamma nai cortex thank you dr man just <clears throat> we are running uh, out of time so uh, thanks for generating lot of discussion i'll i'll request professor jadev pujari to speak on uh, surgery for uh, uh, giant cavernomas and cystic